Jones having to pay one billion, nearly one billion dollars in damages for his claims about the Sandy Hook shooting. We're going to be talking about Tulsi Gabbard leaving the left PayPal and their misinformation policy that they're now backtracking on. Plus a very spicy tweet from Sydney Watson. Let's get into it. Hello, everybody, and happy Wednesday. You might notice we're a little bit early today, and it's because I have an appointment and I got to get out of here at about 3.30. So I'm so sorry, guys. We're ruining your schedule. You know, when it takes six hours to get your hair done. <laughs> I got to I gotta fit it in the schedule somewhere, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let's get into the stories for today. Uh, we saw this just recently go out about two hours ago. Alex Jones has been ordered to pay nearly $1 billion in Sandy Hook defamation trial. You know, I am going to be honest. I've really never watched Alex Jones. Either of you? No. Big info I've just seen fans. the memes where he takes his shirt off and runs around and... So yeah. it says the, they're turning they're the turning frogs. They're turning the game. frogs. <laughs> I've yeah. seen that. I've seen that. Was that a good impression of Alex Jones? I don't watch him, so you guys let me know. <laughs> yeah, the, the only impression I have is just we are so broke. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, you don't know much about him. Other than he's like pr- far this pretty. He's probably the farthest of the right people on. Yeah, I I guess uh, I don't know. I don't. I think this? of him as more like just kind of kooky conspiracy theorist than like right winger. But yeah. I don't know, maybe, I really gen- genuinely don't know. He so. does sort of entertain, I guess, the outskirts arguments on uh, some of these issues and has been known. I, I know a lot of people do like the hashtag Alex Jones was right because he, is, he uh, delves into his own maybe conspiratorial takes or his own predictions. I mean, and we're then... basically living in one giant ongoing conspiracy theory is what it's felt like <laughs> the last couple of years. So, so inevitably, I guess you're going to, you know. You're going to be right. Broken clocks right twice a day, as they say. Right, right, right. So let's read this article and just get into some of the background behind this. So he's ordered to pay nearly $1 billion in Sandy Hook defamation trial. Alex Jones has been ordered to pay $965 million in damages to the plaintiffs uh, of the defamation trial surrounding his lies about the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. The 15 plaintiffs of the case included the relatives of eight Sandy Hook victims, as well as former FBI uh, agent suing Jones. A Connecticut jury reached a unanimous verdict Wednesday afternoon before the judge read aloud a detailed report of the various damages owed to each plaintiff by Jones and his media company, Free Speech Systems. How... Ironic. Uh, Jones was found liable for violating Connecticut's Unfair Trade Practices Act by using lies about the Sandy Hook massacre to sell products on his website. Under the law, there is no limit on punitive damages. So to the best of my knowledge, after the Sandy Hook shooting, Jones sort of took to the Internet and used his platform to talk about a possible conspiracy where he stated that much of this was fake, uh, that several of the parents were, quote, crisis actors, end quote. Uh, And as you can imagine, that doesn't go over well for people. It's a really big accusation. Yeah, it's a very big accusation. And it's, it's, let's just be honest, it's a reprehensible thing to do. And to me, the biggest takeaway from this is play stupid games, win stupid prizes. I mean, Mm -hmm. you, you, if you're, there's, there's one thing to, to say, you know, well, be if I'm a free speech absolutist, but there's another. It's another thing when you are defaming someone, when you're damaging their life, their reputation, their their character. You're sending harassment after them, all that type of stuff. And and there are legal parameters we set around that type of speech, and uh, you can be on the hook for for uh, uh, those damages. And uh, this is just a case that seems to be. Uh, where justice is being issued. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, So here's another quote here. Jones called the Sandy Hook tragedy, quote, as fake as a $3 bill, end quote. Uh, I saw this and I'm like, okay, yeah, I can understand this went to to trial for defamation. I can understand the fact that he lost. And we saw this happen before, months earlier, with two other parents from the Sandy Hook tragedy who sued him and ended up uh, winning their trial. And it was $49 million in damages. Now... We're adding, what was it, $965 million? That's where I'm like, Whoa. It's an absurd amount of money. It is an absurd amount of money. And it's obviously money that he does not have. Right. Uh, and he stated, like, the, I, I don't have this money. There's no way that this is ever going to come to fruition, you know? Right. And I've read that this is going to go to appeals court and likely be negotiated down to something he can actually pay, which would kind of make sense. So maybe this is more of a statement type of verdict 
Um, mm-hmm. But you know, regardless, it's it's pretty crazy to for that to hit your Twitter feed and see someone's fined a billion dollars. Yeah, and it seems part of it. Yeah, it seems like what they're doing. Part of it. Yeah, it seems like what they're doing here is making an example of uh, Alex Jones in what is an attempt probably to thwart off other people going down the same route and uh, putting out messages similar to what he what he says. Now, I would love to think that this is all in relation to his Sandy Hook claims, and I would love to think that this is sheerly seeking out justice for the family members who have been affected, and I think we should recognize that there is a direct effect here. If you go on the internet after a tragedy like this and say, I think those family members are faking, I don't think this is real, uh, what's going to happen is... Not only have you made a, a baseless accusation against them, but people are going to go after these family members who have just gone through something that's unimaginable for, I think, most people. So I imagine that's taken into account with the damages, how it's affected their lives is taken into account with the damages. The fact that he sold InfoWars merch on top of uh, what he was speaking about is probably taken into account with the damages. But nine hundred and sixty five billion dollars, I mean, million dollars is uh, wow. I, like I said, I like to think it's just about the Sandy Hook thing, but it also could be uh, people taking on this chance to make an example of somebody who they disagree with outside of the Sandy Hook comments. Yeah, and that's where the absurd amount of money seems to would would seem to indicate that there's little more here than just finding justice. It's like let's really make example out of him, and so to whatever degree that's you know excessive, um, there's mm-hmm. maybe room for criticism here of, of the severity of the the fine, but. That doesn't excuse running with a false narrative, which for which he, by the way, has apologized. And I think when I saw a line where he said, I've said sorry over and over again for this. I'm done saying sorry. Right. So I don't know. How do we feel about that part? Uh, I mean, you can you can get somebody to say sorry. He's also said, I now believe the Sandy Hook shooting is 100 percent real. But the pretenses of that uh, admission, it, it, you'll never know. I mean, it, and, it, and what does it matter? Right. It, what does it matter whether or not he believes it or he doesn't believe it? Um, you, you've set him in a position where he has to say what you want him to say. If he gets up in court and he says, no, I, I stand by what I said and I still believe it isn't real. I mean, here's another there's another billion dollars. <laughs> right. That's where like not bowing to the mob doesn't really serve you well anymore because you're just going right. to keep getting deeper and deeper down the legal rabbit hole. So. Right. It's different when the mob is like a court with a jury <laughs> and a judge, you know. Mm. So it can be a little bit more difficult, but this is like, also, is this a hill you want to die on type of thing? Yeah, you know this, what I mean? this one, this one's kind of interesting to me because it's, it's one of those things where I feel like, yes, there may be with the, with the number of $965 million, that's virtually impossible for him to repay, but sure. it feels like a bit of revenge, yeah. um, as, as we're alluding to, uh, slightly, or at least posing the question. Um, but it, I feel like those who are going for revenge also have to like the main sh- call it the mainstream media or legacy media. They also have to um, consider why is it that someone like Alex Jones has the platform and the following that he does. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there have always been conspiratorial um, thinking and and following and leaders and whatnot. But um, I, I feel like this is like revenge because they can't let. Um, someone who just questions their narrative to uh, ever have a foothold and and whatnot. So um, there may be some element to that as well. Yeah, I think it's hard to think that there isn't. You know, I think it's always going to be coupled with it. And it doesn't negate the fact that uh, the defamation lawsuit is rightful, but it does speak to what uh, an additional message that's trying to be sent through the the damages. Right. Yeah. To me, a fine that's, you know, somewhat proportionate to his net worth or income Mm -hmm. and Proportionate to like you should every every cent that you made off the back of this lie, mm-hmm. you should pay back. Um, but also and then also a fine. But I don't think that was a billion dollars. And right. so there is definitely a little extra there. So that's my thoughts on that. I mean, our thoughts on that. It's trending. You guys let me know how you feel about this whole situation, how you feel about the storyline in general, uh, because I'm sure there are many people who maybe believe the narrative that he put out there. Uh, if you do, put that in the comments down below. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. But yeah, a billion dollars seems like a bit much. It does. And my, my last thought on this is you, you, you didn't have to go this far with lies. The world is crazy enough to get mm-hmm. attention on reporting <laughs> on true things that are right, crazy. Right. So you, you did you really didn't have to to go here to still go into the realm of the absurd because there's enough absurdity in the real world right now to call right. out. Um, so that's just the I don't know, maybe if there's a lesson here, <laughs> maybe it's somewhere around that. Mm. 
Truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Now, speaking of billions of dollars, let's talk about Pfizer, you guys. Uh, A a company that has managed to garner unbelievable wealth on the backs of your own struggle through the entire COVID narrative, the COVID lockdowns, and the uh, mm, subsequent COVID vaccine mandates that many of us had to face. Now... uh, Here is a video from a COVID hearing where the Pfizer director admits the vaccine was never tested on preventing transmission prior to having people being told that they needed to get vaccinated. Let's watch. It has 9.9 million views, by the way. And we can speculate on this and go through a whole conversation after we watch this video. If you don't get vaccinated, you're antisocial. This is what the Dutch prime minister and health minister told us. You don't get vaccinated just for yourself, but also for others. You do it for all of society. That's what I said. Today, this turned out to be complete nonsense. In a COVID hearing in the European Parliament, one of the Pfizer directors just admitted to me, at the time of introduction, the vaccine had never been tested on stopping the transmission of the virus. This removes the entire legal basis for the COVID passport the COVID passport that led to massive institutional discrimination as people lost access to essential parts of society. I find this to be shocking, even criminal. Please watch the video until the end. Voor u, mevrouw Smal, heb ik de volgende vraag waar ik een duidelijk antwoord op wil. And I will speak in English so there are no misunderstandings. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? If not, please say it clearly. If yes, are you willing to share the data with this committee? And I really want a straight answer, yes or no, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No, uh, these, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. <laughs> this oh. is scandalous. This is scandalous. Let's stop there. We had to move at the speed of science. How do you guys like that answer? We had to move at the speed of, if you were moving at the speed of science, you might have slowed down a little bit and waited and, te- and tested whether or not it was actually preventing transmission. That seems like a pretty important bit of science to figure out before you go forcing things on people. Yeah, and even if you're defining the science as Dr. Fauci, how fast does this guy really move anyway? <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> Thanks, for, that's great. <laughs> but seriously, like, uh, you, that, that, that is actually the problem is mm-hmm. the science is defined as however these, these, the group of bureaucrats that happen to be in power define it. Right. And then uh, whatever we say uh, goes. And so we're following at the speed of what they approve and what they want to impose on society. And I think that's, that, that was uh, the speed that we should not have been running at. We should have been running at the speed of the evidence. Yeah. And that's what the science should mean. But that was also something that was turned down and uh, turned upside down in the last two years. Right, right, right. They're literally like, uh, we wanted as much money, I mean, safety as possible mm-hmm. when it came to rolling out this vaccine. This is exactly what happened here. It's just like... You can tell that these corporations and companies, of course, have a vested interest in getting as many people vaccinated as possible and being as quick as they possibly can be to roll these things out, get you your next after your next after your next after your next and make sure you know that you absolutely need it because you're doing the compassionate thing. But wait a second. Is it compassionate? If it's not preventing transmission, or at least if you don't have the evidence to prove that it's preventing transmission, am I truly saving lives? Am I truly looking out for my peers, my loved ones, my my significant other? If you don't have the proof to tr- to, to tell me that this is actually preventing transmission. No. So what you're really saying is I want money in my pocket. It's my money and I want it now. And for all of these, the censorship and punishment that went around because of people spreading misinformation. Yes. The, I think Daily Wire put together a compilation of so many people from Ryan Selter to Rachel Maddow to government officials and politicians just over and over again saying, you know, the virus stops with every vaccinated person or it stops with you. It, uh, it stops transmission. It stops transmission. And that is misinformation. And, and when if you said anything to 
cast doubt on that narrative at the time, you're censored, you're a pariah, you're a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> That's just maybe the theme of this episode. But, uh, you know, that that happened to be the truth. And that is what is so scary is when you, uh, when you see we've just lost uh, the ability to trust in our, our institutions and, and they've shattered that over the years in mainstream media and uh, the, our health institution, CDC, NIH. It's, I don't know how long it'll take to rebuild any semblance of trust, but, you know, no wonder people just don't take these these institutions or the mainstream media seriously anymore. Right. And it's just like, okay, so we know that what we said, even even on our previous show, Will and Amla, where we talked about COVID and everything, we would make <laughs> we would talk about our own predictions, our own views of what was going on, and then like a year later, it was it was known to be true. Mm -hmm. And then CNN's reporting on it, MSNBC's reporting on it, ABC's reporting on it. Even simple things like maybe exercise and going outside is really important, and we shouldn't be on lockdown because that would help uh, people be proactive about their health and maybe stive off uh, the the illness that can come after getting uh, infected with COVID-19. Get and out of here with that science. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't allowed to say that. That's scientific. Yeah. If you're healthier, you're less likely to die from this. And it's crazy because I'm like sitting here, I'm like, we are not like, we're not geniuses. We're, no. not, we're not the intellectuals of this nation. We're just people with two eyes who have taken in information from, I don't know, elementary school that has taught us about health. Mm -hmm. And you're denying it and calling us, uh, we're calling, we're, we're, we are sources of misinformation. Right. All you had to do was come out with the facts that you know, which I think as we know them now is if you get vaccinated and you have you, it's maybe a good idea if you're older or if you have comorbidities and it will help. It'll reduce the severity of your infection. You could have just said that and, you know, let, left the decision to people, arm them with the facts and let them make the, make up their own minds. But instead, it became this. Uh, you know, this is the way, the only way out of this, any other treatment that we can talk about is off the table. We're, we're going to censor anything about the I word. God, I don't even know <laughs> if we can say it today to this don't day, which dare. is so absurd. <laughs> we're not going to tell people that they should be preventative about this or or get healthy or lose weight or uh, exercise or do anything that can improve their health otherwise or take lots of vitamin D or whatever. There's there was plenty of other things that were just like it was one message. Vaccinate, 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 vaccinate. Yeah. And at the expense of the truth. And yep. that in doubt, undoubtedly ha cause a lot more harm than the people who were trying to express uh, that, hey, there may be more here or, hey, you guys are narrowing uh, everything down to oversimplifying it to one solution when there's a lot more that we could be doing to mitigate this. Right. Yeah. And, and one thing that is kind of annoying throughout this whole entire thing is like we're yes, we listen to the scientists, the doctors and whatnot, but we've we all know that science is a process, the yeah. scientific mm -hmm. process. And, and while none of us are scientists ourselves, um, it's it's a matter of um, them trying to tell us and convince us that the, the cart needed to go before the horse. Mm -hmm. And and that just doesn't make sense in that in that in the scientific world um, to just say that, no, this needs to happen before you have any semblance of results uh, to base your theory on. Um, it's just cart before the horse. And you would think that there would be maybe some system of accountability, but guess what? They are, they are not liable for anything that yeah. happened to you because of this. And somehow they're not liable for the false advertising surrounding this vaccine because they had not done the testing prior to telling people that they should get it. They're not liable for any damages created to you or your livelihood uh, in, in this whole entire COVID pandemic or if anything happened to you because you got vaccinated. None of it. None of it. No accountability whatsoever. Right. Uh, which is you should always have your uh, your the antenna go up of suspicion when there's a lack of transparency and accountability. And there was none of that um, with everything that's been forced on us. And I'm still seeing and hearing like Pfizer ads on uh, on TV and on, on podcasts mm -hmm. and stuff. And um, an acquaintance of my wife was just like, yeah, I just got my fifth booster. And he's like missed days of work every time that, <laughs> that he's uh, gotten mm. boosted. And it's like. What are we doing here, guys? What are we doing here, guys? And all to what end? Because you're still getting it anyways. And you can say it's decreased, but okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Believe what you want to believe, I guess, yeah. in this day and age. But make sure you don't say it out loud because you might get fined for misinformation in this next story. Now, PayPal is backtracked on this, which we'll get to. But... PayPal was in a firestorm on on the Internet and in the news media because it had a new policy that was going to go into effect on November 3rd of this year that would fine people twenty five hundred dollars anytime one of its 
four uh, 429 million consumers and merchants expressed what the corporate brass deemed to be misinformation. And this was detailed in their company policy and, again, was going to be effective on November 3rd. Think about that. Think about your PayPal being fined $2,500 out of nowhere. The rage that I would feel mm. in my heart and soul would be undescribable. Yeah, I mean, this is I'm already... People should be closing their PayPal accounts just because the even if they backtrack, it's like the willingness to go there itself is yep. utterly insane. It's one thing. I mean, it's already horrible to violate someone's freedom of speech uh, and like take down a tweet that you need misinformation mm -hmm. or something like that when it's not. Um, but to literally like take their money, it's yep. how, th there. There's no limit and on how far these people are willing to go. Um, yes. To your 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 whole livelihood is like the, and your whole life is they will not stop until it's like completely under their control and that's what's so orwellian about this when we talk about the uh the digital currencies and all this stuff i'm like i'm need to go back to a place where i'm i want my paycheck in cash and i want to hide it under my pillow <laughs> i'm gonna buy gold with that right. or something and bury it in a hole somewhere like because it is so scary where we are headed with social credit scores and the, the digital currencies and all this stuff it's like it is scary what they're able to do. It's life's looking more and more like an episode of Black Mirror. It is. I mean, and even then, even if you hide it under your pillow, one of those firearms trained IRS agents that they're now rolling out <laughs> is going to show up at your house to get it from you. And it's unbelievable. You know, PayPal as a company comes out and goes, we had no intention of, of ever doing that. We had no intention of taking $2,500 from anybody for misinformation. It was never meant to be a part of the policy. Okay, then why was it written in pretty vivid detail exactly what you were going to do? We accidentally wrote this highly detailed policy <laughs> right, right. That, that, that completely lays out exactly what it is we would want to do in the case of misinformation. And again, what does misinformation mean? It means absolutely nothing at this day and age, because like I said before, we were saying things that were deemed misinformation. Telling people to exercise to prevent uh, some of the most harmful repercussions of COVID was misinformation when we were saying it. That could have got us fined $2,500 from PayPal. And yeah. to think... You know, the average American family, if you ask them right now, couldn't give you $400 in a case of an emergency. So to get fined $2,500 for simply saying something that they deem to be misinformation on the Internet is insane. Insane. Yeah. yeah. And this was uh, Jordan Peterson's point is, is the whole problem with misinformation is who gets to define what constitutes misinformation. Yep. And we, uh, there's no good answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like that doesn't. Would, does misinformation exist? Now, I, it is true that people can can knowingly post falsehoods or put falsehoods out there to mm -hmm. try to influence things a certain way. But uh, I don't know what like what is, who should define misinformation? Is is there a situation in which any entity or institution should be able to define it? You know what? I lean towards. Re I no. I really don't think so. I mean, you have. Like like this Alex Jones stuff that's going to court. You have instances of just like defamation where you've looked at somebody, you've said this person did this thing and that person did not do that thing and you've caused damage to that person. Libel, slander, things like that. I completely understand. Mm -hmm. There's false advertising. So if you're getting money and you, you'd have to point to damages, I guess, uh, that have been... Or, or some sort of theft or stealing in the name of false advertising to deem something misinformation. Right. It's like if if it can be demonstrated with evidence that your claim is false, the best re the best remedy to that is there be le legal liability for knowingly spreading falsehood. Um, and that, but you have to hold that up in a like fair court of law. You know. Right. I, I yeah. I'm trying to think of an instance outside of the ones that I just mentioned where I would be pro coming after somebody for misinformation. All these social media platforms, big tech platforms, social media platforms have their own misinformation policies. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone's done a better job than what the Second Amendment and the, like our, our standard of free speech in America has has done. It's, they'd be right. better off just adhering to uh, uh, First Amendment principles, sorry, free yeah, speech, First Amendment. Yeah. Um, than trying to come up with their own policy on misinformation in which they set themselves up as the arbiter right. of what's what's correct and what's not. Now, you can make the argument it's a private entity and they can make whatever rules they want and mm -hmm. you can make that argument for PayPal, but I haven't seen any private entity do it better than the First Amendment. Right. You're allowed to say things that are untrue, guys, yeah. as long as you're not accusing somebody and causing damages.
you're allowed to say things that are untrue. And even so, yeah, it's just, it really just comes down to who gets to say what's misinformation. It's the same thing with hate speech. Who gets to tell me that yep. I'm being hateful? Who gets to decide what hate speech truly even means? And which is why I'm against the the whole premise of of coming after people for hate speech. Who gets to decide? Yeah. It's like it's unpoliceable. Well, it's it's one of those things that uh, JBP always talks about, too. It's just like in order for people to come to the truth, p- people who say untrue things, right, they could full heartedly believe it. But right. in order for them to actually find the truth, they have to speak those things out into the world and then have discussions with others in order to find that truth, mm-hmm. that that kernel or mm-hmm. uh, you know foundation of truth. Uh, and the only way to do that is through discussion and, and putting these ideas out there and learning yep. that they're not correct. Right. right. And it's the very basis of science itself is to be skeptical and to prove yourself wrong and, and failure being more important than success. That's mm-hmm. it's the very basis of it. And this whole PayPal thing with the with the twenty five hundred dollar fine, it's giving Canada. It's giving Chinese Communist Party uh, where you have basically a social credit system and money can be taken away from you, opportunities taken away from you for the things that you espouse and what you say. And it's to think that we're going in this direction, at least in a corporate sense, because this is PayPal, not necessarily the government. You could speculate as to whether or not they're working in tandem on this or whether or not this is some sort of ESG approved move that they're doing, (laughs) which... uh, we don't. We won't get into uh, on today's show, but uh, that very well could be what's happening here. But it's not the right way to go. I don't want to live in a social credit system. No, I mean, I think nobody does. Generally, would prefer not to. I would generally prefer not to do that. <laughs> um, now we're gonna get into this spicy Sydney Watson tweet and give our thoughts on it, and we'll end on Tulsi Gabbard because we want to end on a high note, and I think something that is uh, something that should be celebrated. Here's Sydney Watson. And uh, American Airlines has responded to her because she went on Twitter saying this. I'm currently literally wedged between two obese people on my flight. This is absolutely not acceptable or OK. If fat people want to be fat, fine. But it's something else entirely when I'm stuck between you and your arm rolls on my body for three hours. OK, she then uh, tagged American Airlines and said, we need to talk. And American Airlines responded, our passengers come in all different sizes and shapes. We're sorry you were uncomfortable on your flight. Now, of course, a bunch of different like conservative people and people in, in this line of work responded to Sydney's tweet, sort of backing her up on this. But I was curious to get your guys' thoughts on it. The initial tweet is certainly not something that I would have put on the internet. I think if I was in this situation on a flight, uh, we fly often, I would just, you know, hit my little call button, have a stewardess come over, go away from the people that I'm sitting next to (laughs) and talk to the stewardess about my current situation in the hopes of getting another seat. That seems like a more reasonable place to start. And hopefully maybe Sydney did that, but you know, who knows? Maybe not. Um, But yeah, that seems like, but it is reasonable to ask for a different seat or for to ask for you to be accommodated in some way because their accommodation of these other people has led mm-hmm. to you getting a very unfair shake. I would have thought that airlines would have a policy that if you were bigger than your singular seat, you'd have to buy two seats. Is that yeah. a policy that airlines have that you guys know of? I don't know. I don't know. And like, how do you measure that? Like, I know they have the little size test for the, your, your carry on, but they, 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 sh- they have one before you get on the plane of like the chair. If you can't sit down in the chair. Right. How would they oh, test? Man. You would be able to see, I'm sure. And be like, yeah. mm, this is not going to work out for you. You would think. Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's a matter of physics and like how much, how many cubic feet your body occupies mm-hmm. right. <laughs> and it could be true of like a bodybuilder as well you know if they're yeah. like just too big for one seat like i'm sorry bro you gotta you know you gotta right. get two right i've seen like body positivity people on the internet and on tiktok and twitter and saying saying that flights should be more accommodating to to bigger people and that they should actually expand the size of their seats for uh bigger individuals Call rather first than class Call yeah. business class yeah i'd honestly say it, it doesn't even have to like body positivity aside it's like you know everybody's getting crammed into these tight seats and they've only gotten smaller and smaller over the years, over the decades. Mm -hmm. And each renovation, they find new ways to minimize cushioning so that they can fit another row of seats in there. Um, And, you know, so it's, it's, it's not like, while this may be taken by the body positivity group as like very negative Mm -hmm. uh, toward, you know, heavier people, Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's it's also not crazy for her to be like, hey, airlines, can you please figure this out? Because no one's comfortable here. Mm-hmm. We are officially banding together with the body positivity movement to create bigger airline seats with more <laughs> space. <laughs> I think this is a shared cause. Well, but then you're, you better be prepared to pay more for your seat because yeah. it's a less, you know, and that's the thing is like there's a, they're a private company again, sure. and mm-hmm. it's a matter of profitability and running a business and it's a it's a very competitive industry uh and so i don't know if, you, if you're the airline that makes the heavier seat or the, the the more spacious seats then you gotta charge more for each one and maybe there is a niche there for people who want to pay more for them coming for, next for the comfort, but standing flights standing, where you just stand honestly, the entire how far, time how far away are we from that <laughs> we are probably not far away <laughs> and then, you know these are the this is the, the the crook of capitalism is how far are we going to go to get that extra money and get people on the plane you mm. know what if you want to be on a standing flight more power to you, I guess, but don't come after my sitting flights. That Spirit Airlines is coming out with that with that next. <laughs> if you want your own pronouns, cool. sure. Just don't tell me I gotta use them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. But okay, what what do we think about American Airlines' response to this? Are they justified in saying? Well, let's go said. read the response again. They said our passengers come in all different sizes and shapes. We're sorry you were uncomfortable on your flight. Um. I mean, the, both statements I would hope are true, but not necessarily hope are true, but I would imagine are true, but also you need to do something. Like there should be a policy for something like that. Uh, and if you are too big to sit, you know, in normally in a plane, you should probably get two seats. You should, that's all I'm thinking. Yeah. It's only logical to me. I, I mean, I agree. I, <laughs> I don't know if they should put like a, any sort of discount on your second seat or something like that. But I feel like you have to have, there has to be some sort of logical, especially with the trajectory that we are on as a nation with obesity. I imagine this is only going to become more and more of a problem. Now I'm, I'm not for shaping the world for its, uh, inconsistencies and for its problems so uh, maybe I'm not for making bigger seats on airplanes other than the fact they'd be more comfortable, but, uh, something needs to be done policy wise. You should buy two seats, I think. Yeah. What do you? What would you say to the argument that if you want to guarantee your comfort on a flight like this, mm-hmm. then you should pay for an upgraded seat that, like in in business class or first class? Do you think that's a valid argument? There's so many different th- problems you're gonna run into. So it's like the these people have created the discomfort for me. Why should I be paying for it? There's that argument, and then you have what I think would be. The most logical argument from the left would be if somebody is obese, it's likely that they are of lower socioeconomic status. How is somebody who is obese and of lower socioeconomic status going to be able to pay for two seats? Um, So and and that's a reasonable argument to make. Uh, So I, I I don't know how you would fix this problem other than facing what is reasonable. And that is somebody needs to move. Yeah. Yeah, and to your to your question, my answer: If are they justified in tweeting this response uh, back to the lady? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say they're justified insofar as like they know they can say that because there are only so many other competitors within the within the flight um, world. Uh, so yeah, they're like, okay, uh, you'd get the same experience on another airline. Sorry, like sorry, we're not sorry. Mm-hmm. Is essentially what they're saying. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Also, the idea that a leftist would say fat people are poor um, is kind of like a very surface level judgment that seems really, I don't know, unfair. I mean, uh, statistically, they would be. Right. right. But I I mean, for them to rely on something like that seems. But also the other thought I had here is when you purchase a flight seat, you're basically purchasing your seat. You're renting out this, you know, space. two square feet of space. And mm. uh, if, if that's my space, does that constitute from like floor to ceiling? And if someone else is like halfway into my space, taking some of my square footage that I rented, that's unjust, right? Very valid point. It's thievery. And we don't even get me started too on like charging by weight because the physics of flying dictate that the more weight that you bring on a plane, the more fuel is consumed, oh, yeah. driving up the cost for everybody. And yet we're already subsidizing larger people uh, by not charging based on weight. So there's another factor 
to consider. This in gets all of clipped, this. and Media Matters says Taylor <laughs> Trandall endorses anorexia in order to fly on planes. Anorexia. That's exactly what's going to happen. I'm but just no, there is something. I just follow the science. There, you know that saying? is that is actually true because when you have a suitcase and it's overweight, you have to pay yeah, the pay freaking the overweight fee. Yeah, so if you're going to bring a bunch mm. of food, and you can just eat it first, and then you don't got to pay for your over your fee. I feel as though we're on the precipice of a breakthrough on this issue. Uh (laughs) We might have to return to it at a later date because we do have to move on to the last story of today. But we'll get back to you guys on how we fix this ever-growing issue in America. I know you guys are really struggling with this one. Anyways, Tulsi Gabbard has come out with a video uh, and tweeted, I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that is now under the control, the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness who divide us by racializing every issue and stoke anti-white racism, actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms. Okay, so it goes on. But... Uh, this is a long time coming, by the way. I mean, this is, should not be a shock to anybody. I don't think this shook the internet. It's like when Dave Rubin came out and said, I've now left the left. It's like, okay, yeah. welcome. Yeah, not the biggest shock in the world, but, you know, good for the her. The closet for was made official. of glass, as they say. <laughs> uh, the closet was indeed made of glass when it came to Tulsi Gabbard. She's off. She's been so vocal about uh, upholding people's uh, freedom of speech, their, their rights in this country, and not racializing everything, and has been a beacon of light on the left-leaning side, and she has now decided to leave them. And here's the video. I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that's under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers who are driven by cowardly wokeness, who divide us by racializing every issue and stoking anti-white racism, who actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms that are enshrined in our Constitution, who are hostile to people of faith and spirituality, who demonize the police but protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, who believe in open borders, who weaponize the national security state to go after their political opponents, and above all, who are dragging us ever closer to nuclear war. Now, I believe in a government that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Unfortunately, today's Democratic Party does not. Instead, it stands for a government that is of, by, and for the powerful elite. Mm. Now, I'm calling on my fellow common sense, independent-minded Democrats to join me in leaving the Democratic Party. If you can no longer stomach the direction that the so-called woke Democratic Party ideologues are taking our country, then I invite you to join me. Woo! 8.2 million views on that. Now, we're not going to say anything about the Democratic Party in particular. That's not within our wheelhouse, uh, but we will uh, talk about it as far as the left pertains to the issue. And everything she said is true. I mean, they are, they are warmongering, which is so atypical for the left. Uh, when you look at history and you look at uh, liberalism as it's been practiced for decades, uh, they are stoking a fire of racial division in this country. And uh, we've all experienced it. We've all seen it with our with our very eyes. Uh, and there is anti-white racism, as she also expressed, which is something it's a no, no word. Right. We can't wear those White Lives Matter sweatshirts anymore. And they are stepping on our freedoms and uh, wanting to disenfranchise people as much as they like to complain about being disenfranchised they are disenfranchising others Mm -hmm. so this is a brilliant move from tulsi gabbard again the closet was made out of glass we knew she was going to do that (laughs) anyways uh but yeah i I think this is great and it's going to what it what it does is that i think there were a lot of left-leaning people who followed tulsi they might have dropped off maybe a little sooner than this very moment here because we saw this coming but they're they follow her they're inspired by her and her putting out this message and saying this is the moment that i'm choosing to tell you this here's why i'm doing it and here's what you should do uh is very very powerful and i think it's going to influence people yeah i'm reminded of uh colin wright's cartoon that he drew of you know democrats or leftists from 2008, where like if you were slightly left of center in 2008, mm-hmm. the left has so far left you behind that now you're right of center because if you just stayed liberal, liberal meaning like you still care about evidence and reason and right. making rational arguments and not imposing your views on people and you're not in this fanatical wokeness. If you're still like if you were center left a decade ago or a little more than that, um, then now you the, the the center has moved far 
to the left of you and right. you are now on the right of it. Right. Um, and I think that it's it's good for people who uh, still adhere to ideas of liberalism. Like like Tulsi is what I wish uh, the Dem- Dem- Democrats or people on the left were, <laughs> did represent. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, we may disagree on how to approach uh, health care or different economic policy um, in a traditional like liberal versus conservative right. uh, context. But, but let's have the conversation. Yeah, but let's have the conversation and we both share a commitment to open uh, exchange of ideas and let the best ideas win out and let's debate and and instead of this like silencing and moralizing everything and trying to cancel people and all this mm-hmm. stuff and and I think it's also telling and good that she called out this the idea of cowardly wokeness and my mm-hmm. mind immediately went to that video that's going viral right now of the uh, the doctor who's swearing in all the graduates of medical school I think from University of Minnesota or something mm-hmm. and and it's a medical school event and all of the students are having to recite this uh this creed or whatever that's saying we commit to acknowledging the indigenous tribal methods of Mm -hmm. healing and we acknowledge that we're on stolen land and it's like y'all are medical professionals we need to focus on the competence and things that we have evidence to actually work not worrying about this woke stuff what is that that's cowardice it's cowardly to kowtow to political correctness and virtue signaling at the expense of what you know to be true and what you yes. know to be the the evidentiary like something supported by evidence and what and what's right and uh, anyways so good on her for for good calling this out and and i hope that we get more disaffected liberals um yeah who who can lay that to get this wokeness uh under control um, because it is definitely out of control on that side of the aisle. Yeah, and I love that you pointed out that phrase cowardly wokeness because so often these people who do subscribe to woke ideology are made out to be brave and courageous and loud and fierce. And while they are loud, uh, they are cowardly in that. They cower behind their hive mind mentality. They cower behind this idea that they have enough power to stifle dissent. They cower uh, when we try to face them head on and challenge them in their beliefs and talk to them uh, one-on-one and have a, a healthy debate with them. They they cower in nearly every instance where you could stand up with integrity, stand behind your views, have your views challenged, and be the better for it. So it is cowardly wokeness at its heart and again yeah cheers for tulsi gabbard i i'm I'm happy to see her come to the forefront and just state it plainly and if the left were smart they would follow her example rather than castigate her and ridicule her but you know I think the early reactions we've seen from the blue checks on Twitter and from mainstream media coverage and the snarkiness around her just shows that they have not learned their lesson and they're going to continue to double down on wokeness, which mm-hmm. I think is ultimately a losing battle. So whatever. <laughs> oh, and I would say just from a personality perspective and the way she speaks and communicates, Tulsi is a winner. I like she is she is. What I think the future of political discourse is probably going to be is conversations the way that Tulsi has them and the way that she communicates them. She is strong, she is fierce, but she is sort of stoic and just stands strong in her beliefs and is very calm. There's there's no there's no need to uh, be overly emotional in the things that you're stating. She just states it plainly and goes, I think this is the logical, reasonable thing to, to agree with. Mm-hmm. And there might be instances where I do disagree with Tulsi, uh, but uh, reasonable people are reasonable people. Yeah. And and the evidence of that, I mean, she just went on Joe Rogan, I think, for another three hour conversation Mm -hmm. and and just the ability to show up and speak intelligently, speak your mind. And, you know, in a three hour conversation, you can't rely on political talking points. And that's what I love about it. So it is, you know, I like you said, I may disagree with her. There's some there's some stances that I've heard of that she has that's uh, I don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, But that's not what this is about. This is about, hey, it's encouraging to see someone who was in the political sphere as part of the party on the left who is uh, recommitting herself to free thought, to free inquiry, to actually discussing ideas, to uh, and, and calling out the excesses of the wokeness and the, the authoritarianism that's on the left right now. And there will be more. Yeah. This is wholly unsustainable. Cowardly wokeness is unsustainable. It will not last. It will not live because reasonable people and rational, rational people will continue to wake up. So that's a great silver lining, I think, to close out today's show. We're going to read some super chats. Lucille May says, I'm 13 and I love your content so much. Lucille, you're way ahead of me when I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> I was 13. I was not not doing anything like this. So, I mean, good for you. That, 
that's, yeah. that's very cool. Very, very cool. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your super chat, Lucille. And we hope to see you on the next show. Uh, from DA Travels. When will you and PragerU relocate to Texas? Love your content. Cheers from East Texas. I am not in the foreseeable future. We're here in LA. Hunker down. Fighting the good fight. Fighting the good fight in the center of the good fight. We are an oasis in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Essentially. But, but you enjoy that freedom and rodeos and barbecue. Yep. We will live <laughs> vicariously through you. <laughs> Eat some ribs for us. Yeah. Uh, and then Shock Therapy WIW says, Hi, Conscience, with you. And uh, with you on the plane and wait pay, Taylor. Oh, good. We're starting a movement. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to launch. You know, Daily Wire launched Jeremy's Razors. We got Amala's Airlines. Where <laughs> no, you Taylor, are this is you. you know, someone else. You. Okay, Taylor, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor's flights. I don't know. But someone did make a good point. You should be charged for half a seat if since you're so small. Mm. Because you take up less space. But does that mean somebody has to like come into my seat space and sit next to me? I, if so, yeah. I'll pay for the full seat. Maybe they should have benches, <laughs> and you like submit your your width. There's and like girth. inch mark. They you, you you submit your you enter that in when you're booking your ticket. How much girth do you want? Oh. You can do the you can you why have to go word. You have to <laughs> just why <laughs> width. Yeah, there you go. Better. You have to at least as much as your actual measurement, and you can rent more if you want. Yeah. Mm. Guys, I think we're onto something here. We got a, we got a good like uh, said, comment here too, Taylor. Your airline would be Taylor. Taylor. Tay oh, okay. I was struggling to think of something on the fly. That's oh my gosh, good. we will not be paying you for that comment. We're actually <laughs> just going to steal it, and yeah. uh, you'll not be compensated. Sorry. So sorry. You shouldn't have told Capitalism. us that. Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then lastly, from Hannah Daly, thank you. No message, just a super chat. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate it. And that is Wednesday's show. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a quick one, but I got uh, somewhere to be. I got to go get my hair pulled on for like six hours and uh, I'll get back to you. We do have a show tomorrow with a very special guest by the name of Dr. Deborah So, a neuroscientist. And we, and also former left-leaning social justice warrior, and we're going to be debunking a lot of the myths around gender and, and having a, a in-depth conversation with her. So stick around for that if you truly want to get educated on the issue and arm yourself with the facts to talk to people about this stuff. So that's tomorrow. And then Taylor and I are headed out to Minnesota. Oh, yeah, don't you know? Oh, yeah. My, my home state. I got a speech at Winona State University. <laughs> your, your accent need, needs some work, but it's fine. <laughs> it does. We'll work on it in Minnesota with the Minnesotans that I meet. Uh, so, Skull Vikings. So, yeah, if you guys are listening right now and any of you are in Minnesota near the, is it Winona or Winona? You know, that I actually don't know. Rochester. I think it's Winona. I think it's Winona. Winona. Yeah. We know enough. Uh, if you guys are in that area and you'd love to come see me speak, uh, it is free. Uh, and PragerU has posted the link where you guys can get tickets if you'd like to come and join us. Like I said, Taylor and I will be there. Hopefully we get some spicy protesters who want to come and debate. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah, I will have my camera ready. Yep, and you guys will still have a Friday show, so do not worry. There will be a Friday show. You will not be missing out on any content. We'll be here. Uh, and yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we go live and eat your greens. Bye, guys.